slow and uh, speedy delivery. <laughs> and in case you don't know, I play Mr. McFeely or on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And I've done that for many, many years. And I thought I had, when I began, a job for one year. And here I am. And so today, I thought I would uh, tell you how it all began, how I got into it. And uh, then there's a little what next moment. So I'll begin uh, from the beginning. When I was about nine years old, my grandfather took me to see my first play at the Nixon Theater in downtown Pittsburgh. And the name of the play was Harvey. And it starred a comedian of, at the time. Some of you may have heard of him. His name is Joe E. Brown. And he played Elwood P. Dowd. And he was the constant companion of a six foot tall white rabbit. And only Elwood could see the rabbit. No one else could. And I was captivated by the whole experience, not only by the play, but by the theater itself, the atmosphere. The Nixon Theater in downtown Pittsburgh, no longer there, was built in about 1900. And it was the most opulent theater they've ever produced in Pittsburgh. And sadly, it's torn down. But I remember a sea of red velvet, polished marble, and gold trim. Beautiful theater. And at the curtain call, uh, the cast left the stage. But uh, uh, Joey Brown stayed. And he took a, a, a chair from the, the set and turned it around and set it down, sort of straddled it, and began to talk to the audience. <laughs> and, and I thought this was wonderful. He uh, was telling jokes and he was telling st stories and asking questions and answering questions. And, and then he finished up his set by doing a little spoon trick. And then he got up and started to leave the stage. But he, he remembered, he came back and took Harvey by the paw and let him off the stage. Uh, well, later that evening, I recreated my version of Harvey and I played all the parts that was in our basement at home. And after my performance as, as Harvey, I was determined to have some involvement in some sort of theater. Well, years later, I studied at the Pittsburgh Playhouse. And then I moved to Los Angeles. And I was only there for about a year because I decided to come back to uh, study or finish, actually, my degree in English Lit and Theater. And then I had full intentions of going right back to, to Los Angeles. But uh, in the spring of 1967, I uh, had a chance to go to London to visit my cousin who was working there. And then I was going to meet a friend. And we were going to tour Europe on $5 a day. Well, you could if you didn't eat. But, uh, and if you traveled around Europe at that point, this is 1967. And no cell phones, and no iPads, no computers. So it was difficult to reach someone. And a friend of mine from the States was trying to get a hold of me. His name was Bob McCulley. And uh, wisely, he left messages at the London American Express office in, in hopes that I would get them. That's what you did when you didn't have a cell phone. So uh, I did get them. And the message was, from Bob, that Fred Rogers was starting a new program, a national version of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood to air on PBS. And Bob had submitted my name, and he hoped that uh, Fred would hire me to be part of the, the staff. And he even made an appointment for me. So when I came back to the States, I had an appointment with Fred Rogers, and I met him. And you know, I never knew Fred personally, but I uh, knew who he was because in the early years he had a program called the Children's Corner, and then there was a regional version of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. So I knew that much about him. And during our our uh, our visit, or my interview, I guess you'd say, uh, he told me about the concept of the program and the job I was interviewing him for was uh, to be in charge of the props and the costumes and the trolley and to make sure the puppets were dressed and ready to be <laughs> for taping. Well, at the end of the interview, he hired me. 
I had a job. And then he said, he said, uh, oh, I know you've had some uh, experience performing. Uh, I want you to play a delivery man. This is a new character that we're going to introduce, and the delivery man will help me introduce new items or ideas or props or some unusual items that we can show the children. Well, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood started nationally. The first showing was of all days, February 19, 1968. And who would have thought I would be here saying that I, it, it, it was just such a coincidence. So that means it's 46 years I've been delivering in the neighborhood and still delivering. <laughs> well, however, we started taping in the fall of 1967, so we'd have a backlog of programs. And on the first day of taping, I had all my assignments done, and I had the props distributed. The people had their costumes. And, oh, yes, I had uh, the trolley on the track, and King Friday had his crown on, and all the puppets were ready to go. And I was in my delivery uniform, standing in the corner of the studio, uh, waiting for the taping to begin. And, and Fred Rogers got a phone call, and it was from the president of the Sears Robux Foundation, who helped us with our funding. And they were calling to wish us well and, and tell us that uh, they liked the scripts and they were behind us. However, there was one thing that they mentioned. They said, please don't call the delivery man Mr. McCurdy because Mr. McCurdy was the name of the president of the Sears and Roebuck Foundation. And Fred was saying, well, thank you. That's what he was saying. But they thought that was a little too self-serving. So Fred hung up and he came into the studio and right up to me and he said, we have to get you a new name. We're starting in 20 seconds or 20 minutes, 20 minutes of the first taping. Uh, and then he said, McFeely, that's your new name. You are now Mr. McFeely because his middle name is Fred McFeely Rogers and his grandfather's last name is McFeely. So here I am. I'm, I'm now Mr. McFeely. I guess he thought McCurdy, McFeely. At any rate, we taped the first segment, and my first delivery was a South American rodent, I guess, an armadillo. Amb I don't know how it fit into the script. I've forgotten, but somehow it was a logical inclusion. And, and the name of my delivery service, my one-person delivery service, was Speedy Delivery. So... At the end of the scene, I exited, and as I exited, I turned around to Fred and said, well, speedy delivery, Mr. Rogers, and he said, speedy delivery, Mr. McFeely, and off I went. And it's been my catchphrase ever since, speedy delivery. <laughs> well, we were a success, and we went from black and white into, into color. And during our sixth season, we were in Los Angeles uh, taping some segments of the program. And Fred and the crew went back home when we were finished. However, I decided to stay in Los Angeles for a little mini vacation. And I was sitting at the pool at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel, relaxing in the sun and sipping what they had then. They called them Orange Juliuses. And I was sipping one of those. And it was one of those sky blue Los Angeles day. It was so alluring, the pool, the palm tree. And I thought to myself, oh, yes, and they were taping a, a segment from a uh, a TV series in the corner of the, of the patio by the pool. And I thought, this is wonderful. You know, maybe I should try something. I'm back in Los Angeles. Why don't I circulate my resume and see what happens? So I did. I uh, circulated around and made a few calls. And then a couple of days later, I was making some return calls. And I said, well, why am I doing this? I, I love my job. It gives me all the pleasure that I want out of a job. It uh, services all my egos. I love coming to work every day. So back I went to the neighborhood of make-believe. <laughs> and, and then a few years later, Fred and I were in Los Angeles. No, we were in New York City. That's where they taped it. We were in New York City, and uh, Fred was on the David Letterman show at NBC. And then I was in charge of public relations for the program. So I uh, 
was with Fred, and they were rehearsing uh, what Fred would do that night on the program. And in between that time, uh, the stage manager came over to me. He was uh, like the floor manager, and he was, I don't know why he was whispering, but he said, do you know what you should do? You should take Fred Rogers up to Studio 8H. It's Friday, and they're rehearsing Saturday Night Live, and you should you should surprise Eddie Murphy. <laughs> so, and that, for those of you who don't know, Eddie Murphy for years would do a, a spoof of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood called Mr. Robinson's Neighborhood. So, I said, Fred, are you willing? And then he said, yes. Yeah. So he, got, he, said, he said, see that elevator? Take that elevator and go right up to 8H. So we went up and they were on a break. And um, they were... And somebody said, oh, 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 Eddie's in his dressing room. Uh, they're on a break right now. So he said, just go on over. So we did. And, and, and Fred knocked on the dressing room door, and Eddie opened it. And he, he really sort of like backed up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then he gave Fred a big hug and said, the real Mr. Robinson. <laughs> and, and somebody... On, in the cast or crew had a Polaroid camera and they took a picture of the two of them and Fred then took that picture down and showed it to, to Letterman during the, uh, the broadcast of the Letterman show. Uh, and he held it up and the audience applauded. <laughs> they knew all about Mr. Robinson. Well, Fred Rogers skillfully used television to communicate. Even someone as cool and as famous as Eddie Murphy felt a connection. Well, meeting Eddie was years ago, but just recently, uh, some, some cast members and I, we were at the at a Weld Park, which is just right down the road, uh, meeting uh, families and children. And uh, this family came up to me with uh, a teenage son in a, in a wheelchair. I had met them before, but this time they brought a, a, a picture of me as McFeely holding a little boy. And they said, do you know who this is? And I said, no, I don't. And then they pointed to the, their son in the wheelchair, and it dawned on me, I've been meeting this child for almost all of his life. And we at Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood are touchstones, I think, for Fred Rogers. A connection for families to return year after year to our visits or other places that we are. But of everything that I have done and I do on, on the program and for the program, these visits are the most important to me. That connection with our audience. You know, as the saying goes, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And there's another saying that Fred Rogers always used, and that was a, I believe it was a saying used by, well, you may know it. Uh, attitudes are caught, not taught. If you do something that you love in front of children, they'll catch your love and your enthusiasm. And I think that's what my grandfather did. Uh, I caught his enthusiasm. I caught his love for the theater. And I caught his wanting to be with me, his, his grandson. And here's my what's next moment. Recently, I was in Los Angeles visiting our grandchildren, and I took uh, our granddaughter, who's now seven, her name is Maddie, to see her first play. It was the, the stage, stage version of the Mary Poppins, not the movie, but they have a stage version of it. And all those memories came back of my being with my grandfather many years ago at the Nixon Theater. And recently, 
I spoke with our daughter, and Maddie has asked if she could take dancing and singing lessons. So I guess I've come full circle. Nixon Theater, Harvey, Maddie, and dancing. For Maddie, the what next moment is just beginning. Only time will tell. As for me, I have loved what I've been doing all these many years, 46 now, with Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. And therefore, I guess I've never worked a day in my life. And for that, I have my grandfather Newell, Joe E. Brown, and Fred Rogers to thank and the generations of children who grew up in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Speedy delivery in. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. <laughs> Thank you.